Fall is here. It's the best time of the year. Especially if you live in the mountains. The air is crisp, clean, and clear. The humidity that suffocates us in the summer is gone, and the breeze is nearly constant, whereas during the summer there was no breeze, as if the humidity stifled even that. All life is put into some sort of limbo during the summers here. Even wildlife activity seems to enter a lull during the hottest months. But now, well, now the whole region is alive again. There is an upswell of activity in the forests and in the towns. Fall decorations adorn lawns and houses. The town where I live even decorates the streets and sidewalks for fall. Bold oranges and reds, bright yellows, earthy browns paying homage to autumn in the Appalachians. The farmers harvest their late crops and prepare their cold-weather plants. Fodder shocks appear. Cornfields are prepped for corn mazes. Festivals are scheduled every weekend through fall and into the early part of winter. Really, is it any wonder this is my favorite time of year? Not to mention my two favorite holidays are just around the corner, Halloween and Thanksgiving. For Halloween, families gather around open fires and roast hot dogs and marshmallows. My family always has a Halloween party with games. The whole neighborhood takes part. The scavenger hunt grows more popular every year, and the clues, well, a bit more ridiculous. A few years back, my dad got a scavenger hunt clue that had him taking exactly 139 baby steps towards a big apple tree. A 70-year-old grumpy man out in the dark with a flashlight, laughing along with the rest of us was priceless. In the end, the prize was inside that tree. I think it was a little chocolate pumpkin, but we still remember my dad so carefully counting out those tiny little steps one by one. It's a good memory to have of him. <laughs> it's a funny memory, actually. Now that same year, my cousin and I had come up with the idea to visit a lonely, abandoned house that we had all wondered about for years. The last person to live there had died in the late 1940s, but our grandmother said that the house was still in pristine condition on the inside. She had told us many stories about that house. Most of them were intended to keep us scared away from it. It had worked for many years, but Danny and I were in our late 20s, and we had grown out of what we considered childhood fears. Dad overheard our plans, and he threw a fit. He forbade us from going. He swore to tan our hides with his belt if we went. Dad was a big man. Even in our 20s, we didn't want to get on his bad side. We'd both had our share of whippings from him over the years. Admittedly, we deserved more than what we got. I patted Dad's shoulder and told him we wouldn't go if it meant that much to him. Danny started to revolt immediately, but I winked at him and made a shushing gesture. He understood I was just placating Dad, not wanting to upset him, or get him after us with the belt. It had been a good evening. I walked Dad home and sat on the front porch drinking apple cider with him for almost two hours. He talked about the old days, his childhood, and then the conversation turned inevitably as it always did to my mother. She passed away when I was only 12. I tried to steer the conversation down a more peaceful road before I left for the night, but, well, it wasn't easy. Finally, with the visit over, and my dad on his way to bed, I locked up the house and went outside. I petted Gunther, the family dog, for a good 15 minutes, just to make sure no lights came on in the house. Dad was really in bed for the night, and I set off to meet Danny at the end of our hollow. We had to drive a little way up an old overgrown dirt road, and then walk to the house on the mountain. The moon was full, giving us good light as we meandered through the undergrowth and years of untamed vegetation. We talked and laughed easily, not worrying about anyone hearing us that far up the mountainside. Now, to give some perspective, the old gothic-style two-story 
sat in a huge clearing from which we could see our family's houses in the hollow below, but they looked very small. We could make out dim lights from a few windows and the embers of our fire still glowing in the pit. We weren't using flashlights, so there was no light to draw anyone's attention if they happened to be roaming around outside. And if anyone did see movement at the old house, well, we knew they'd be too scared to check it out. No one wanted to go near that house except for Danny and I. Stepping into the clearing where the house sat, we both fell silent as we studied the undeniable, spooky beauty of the place. We hadn't been anywhere near it in, well, probably ten years at least. Back then, we had been too scared by tales of the old lady's ghost to go near it. Danny laughed nervously and asked if we were really going in. I assured him that I most assuredly was going inside. I had to know if the stories held a gram of truth. The clearing looked as if someone had trimmed the grass at least a few times during the mowing season. The dead leaves blanketed everything, and they crunched loudly underfoot. The pungent aroma of dead and dying greenery set the mood, and the tall spires on the roof stood out blackly against the moonlit sky. Clouds rolled across the sky behind them, and it reminded me of a disused Halloween movie set. The large stained glass windows reflected the moon and the movement of the clouds, giving the illusion sometimes of a person looking out from behind curtains. Now we spent enough time in the yard, looking up at the place to make me think that, just maybe, all those childhood fears hadn't disappeared after all. I turned and looked at Danny. I asked him, if he remembered the place being so big the last time we were up there, he said no. It was as if the house had somehow grown, but if there had been an addition built onto it, it would have been noticeable. There were no signs of that. It was just larger. Now they say fear plays around with perception, so maybe I was more afraid than I even realized. Danny shifted from foot to foot casting longing looks back towards the hollow and those dimly lit windows. The chill in the air had set our teeth chattering as the constant low breeze washed over us. We checked our flashlights and then walked to the back of the house. It was as spooky and enchanting from that side as it was from the front. The wood had lost its many coats of paint and had turned to a blackish color. The porch was still solid enough to walk across. I wouldn't have jumped to test it, though. And the screen door was still completely intact and swung open easily. But its spring squealed, causing us both to startle. Looking at each other with wide eyes, we burst out laughing. We may have been in our mid-twenties, but we were still two chicken-shit kids after all. I said to him, Hey, I guess things never change, Danny. I chucked him on the shoulder and reached for the doorknob, expecting the door to be either locked or swollen and stuck in the jam. The knob, however, turned easily. I grinned at Danny, and he took a deep breath and nodded, pointing his flashlight at the door. When I pushed the door inward, there was an audible gasping sound, as if the whole house drew a deep breath. The cool air outside whooshed around us, pulling our hair and our shirt tails forward, toward the house, as if it were ushering us in, giving us a little push, if you will. There was a lull in the air for a split second, and then a small gust exited the house, and there was a soft sighing sound from the house. It was oddly warm and smelled slightly of rot and mold, and then the air stilled. The constant breeze that had accompanied us up the mountain was gone. We didn't have any nervous chuckles or, in fact, any words as we looked at each other that time. The doorknob thudded against the wall inside. The hinges were silent, and Danny trained his beam of light inside. We were looking into the kitchen, and I was sure I was seeing the whole room wrong. 
The wooden floor shone as it had been freshly polished just that day. The old wood cook stove sparkled in our beams. And the table was set for a meal, except there was no food present. I laughed then, and I nudged Danny and motioned for him to follow as I stepped inside, completely overwhelmed at the condition of the place. There was no rot or mold in sight, no sagging roof or floor. Hell, there wasn't even a cobweb to be seen. We moved to the living room where the blue and violet colored furniture looked as if it had been taken from a 1920s furniture showroom and placed on the mulberry carpet just for us. I sat on the sofa, marveling at how sturdy it still was. Danny shook his head when I told him to sit on it. He looked pale and frightened. The accent pillows were puke green with wide gold ribbons down the middle and matching fringes encircled them. It was beautiful, yet terrible all at once. It made my grandmother's love of light purple walls and garish red carpets seem okay. There were new logs in the fireplace, and the protective screen hadn't tarnished at all. Three large oil lamps sat on the mantel. I lit them. I'm not sure why, it just seemed like a good idea. But Danny didn't like it. He said that we should leave and asked if I didn't find it too weird that the place was showroom clean. I did. I honestly did, that's what I was thinking, but I couldn't help myself. I had to go on. I just had to see the rest of the house. There was a sitting room, a music room. There was a large banquet room and a large pantry replete with jars of vegetables on the shelves. There was a large zinc bathtub in the corner of another room, and I climbed in it, imagining what it would have been like to use it back in the day. I liked fantasizing about how they lived back then. I'd heard so many stories. Real life didn't live up to the romanticized notions, though. It rarely does. Upstairs, there were several bedrooms furnished with the antiques in perfect condition. The stained glass windows and their gothic arch frames were beautiful. They cast pale colored light from the moon onto the wooden floors. And so we made our way up to the attic. And that's where the reality of the place started to show. There were ragged holes in the roof, drifts of dead leaves on the sagging floor rodent and bird corpses that had mummified over the years, and that faint smell of rotten mold. Thick cobwebs with remains of leaves stuck in them, waved in the corners. They were so thick that they looked fake. And just then, the wind began to blow through the holes in the roof and windows, howling and sighing as it carried the odor of death to us, and a chill ran through my body and I was suddenly overcome with the need to run out of the house. Of course, with Danny there to witness it, I refused to give in to that urge. I had to save face in front of him. I turned to tell him that we should go back downstairs, only to see that he had already gone down the stairs to the third floor. The third floor held only three rooms, and they were all empty. I headed back down, and I yelled for Danny, but... I heard his retreating footsteps already at the bottom of the first floor stairs. I laughed and descended to the second floor, looking around one last time as I went. The banister was covered in a thick layer of dust and spiderwebs quivered between the balusters. My gait slowed as I ran my hand over the railing. Dust sifted into the air and fell towards the landing. I stopped at the second floor landing with my foot on the top riser and turned my light down the hallway. It was a wide corridor with rooms on both sides. The settees there had been lush, perfect, rosary velvet. I had sat on one and crossed my legs primely, laughing at Danny's repulsed expression. It had all transformed. Dust covered them like blankets. The six-foot-tall stained glass window at the end of the hall had been shattered almost completely out, and leaves skittered towards me in the breeze. 
They were piled up against the walls and were caught in the doorways. Taking a tight, shaky breath, I bolted down the steps, which were now covered with the same debris and filth that coated the attic and third floor. I yelled for Danny again, but the voice that came out wasn't mine. It was feminine sounding. I cleared my throat and tried again. The name I called out wasn't Danny's. The woman's voice that came out of my mouth plainly called out for someone named Walter. I heard Danny scream in fright from the kitchen, and then the door slammed, rattling the glass and its panes. I headed downstairs, my legs feeling weaker, thinner somehow. I didn't know what was happening. All I knew was that I needed to get out of the house immediately. By the time I reached the landing, I was out of breath and nauseous. I tried to yell again, and my own deep voice mingled with that of the woman again. I turned, sure that someone was there with me, mocking me. There was nothing. The first floor was in terrible shape. None of the furniture was solid. It had all crumbled decades ago. Vines grew in through the holes in the floors and in the living room. The roof sagged so far down that I couldn't walk through it. In the pantry, all the vegetables had rotted in their jars and the metal lids had rusted away. The kitchen's floor yawed severely to one side as I moved cautiously over it, and the old cook stove had shunted forward into a large hole that showed a deep basement with a dirt floor. I looked out the back door, but I didn't see any sign of Danny. I tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. I pounded on the wood and yelled for help. I was trapped inside. I pounded on the glass and the panes, and that's when I saw my hands. They weren't mine. They were a woman's hands. Pale pink nail polish adorned the perfectly shaped nails and there was a thin gold wedding band on the left hand. At that point, I freaked out. The high-pitched wailing was also that of a woman, and I was afraid it was from a woman who died there in the late 1940s. I started kicking at the door. Superimposed over my legs was the grainy image of a woman's dress, and over my hiking boots, a woman's low-heeled dress shoes. They moved with my feet and legs, I had stopped screaming, unable to stand the sound of her voice coming from my throat any longer, but I was still pounding at that door, and I would have done that until I died, or until that woman possessed me, absorbed me, killed me, or whatever she was doing. And then, there was a sensation like an earthquake, a violent earthquake. I fell on my ass, sprawled on that rotting floor, and watched as the house healed itself. It wasn't fast, it took several minutes to return the kitchen back into the sparkling thing I had seen when I first entered. I could barely breathe, but footsteps on the porch drew my attention. The door. I could get out. I stood and tried to move toward the door, but the entity that had been mingling its energy with mine had finally taken over and I couldn't step forward, couldn't speak, couldn't make any sound at all. I watched, frozen in place between the kitchen and the living room, as the back door swung silently inward. The inhalation of air swooshed past me and up the steps, and the warm sigh of exiting air carried away the faint smell of rot and mold. And just then, my dad stepped inside, carrying an old lantern, and he shook his head at me. Damn fool, boy. I told you not to come here. I couldn't speak, couldn't tell him I was sorry. He moved toward me and stood close. Mary Elizabeth, you let him go now. I wanted to ask him what the hell he was talking about, but I couldn't. The sensation of being in a gale force wind enveloped me. I didn't stumble back, but the sensation was the same. Then... She was gone from me and I could speak. I grabbed my dad, hugging him tight. I pulled back and started leading him to the door, eager to get the hell out of there. But he groaned and bent double. 
My first thought was heart attack. I grabbed his shoulder with both hands and tried to drag him outside to the porch, all the while yelling for Danny. A woman's apparition appeared inside the kitchen and held its hand out towards us. Dad was pulled back inside. The force was so great that it took me too. I wasn't letting go of my father. I screamed at her to stop, but she kept pulling us without touching us. Dad's feet left the ground and he turned his head to the side. Get out, boy, go! His voice was that of a young man, not a 70-year-old man. And the shock of it caused me to lose my grip and I fell backward into the couch, the boards under me cracking and bowing. Danny was at my side, grabbing my arm. He looked inside and we both saw my dad grow hazy. A transparent cyclone encircled him, and an instant later, he was gone. The woman's apparition was gone too. I screamed for my father and tried to rush back through the door, but it slammed in my face and the entire place began to deteriorate in front of us. Danny dragged me back into the yard, and I stood at the edge of the clearing, watching helplessly as the structure caved in on itself leaving only a pile of rubble as proof of its existence. Now all that happened a few years ago. The logical part of my brain has come up with a plausible story about what really happened that night. The house was full of mold that it caused me and Danny to hallucinate that it was in perfect condition. We'd heard all the detailed stories about the place, and that's why we were able to imagine it so well. As for my dad, well... He followed us there to make sure we didn't get hurt. Danny got spooked and ran outside to safety, thinking that I was right behind him. My dad rushed inside to get me out when the house started creaking and falling apart. And that hole I saw on the kitchen floor didn't lead to a basement, but a sinkhole. My dad fell in it while pushing me out of the house. The house collapsed, plugging the opening of the sinkhole, and therefore... There was no body ever found. Now, that's what the logical part of my brain believes happened that night. I could have convinced myself it was true if it hadn't been for Danny being with me. But we don't talk about what really happened. <laughs>